is you can just add a simple attractor to your scene to create this great effect. No other work was necessary. And you can combine scene kit and sprite kit. So what are you seeing here? So the paintballs are being shot into the scene as 3D objects using the 3D collision system to collide with the torus, another 3D object. We then take a paint splotch sprite, say that three times fast, and paste it into a sprite kit canvas off screen you don't see. We take the results of that and texture map it onto the torus. So it creates this really convincing, cool combination of sprite kit and scene kit made, made possible by the, the integration of these APIs. And finally, of course, you have shaders. We have vertex, surface, and fragment shaders. Here you have a simple vertex shader, which is manipulating the model's geometry in real time. We have surface shaders where you can affect the surface and uh, lighting properties of our model, here creating this cool caustic effect. And finally, fragment shaders, which can create amazing pixel level effects, like this glass globe effect here. So that's seeing a couple of shaders. Now I'd like to take a minute to have Jacques show you how easy it is to enable some of these features using our Xcode tools. Thanks, Jeff. So uh, new in Xcode 6 are built-in tools for Sprite Kit and Scene Kit. You can edit content right within Xcode. I'm going to give you a quick tour of that right now. So here we have the Sprite Kit editor in Xcode 6. You see the per pixel scene we had from the iPad demo earlier. I'm going to make some quick edits to it in edit mode, which I'm currently in. And then I'm going to switch to simulate in simulate mode to see the physics live. So I'm going to go over here on the right to my media library, which includes all the images inside my project. I'm going to drag one of these squirrels into here. And I'm going to place it using the new snap-in feature. And then I'm going to simulate this. <coughs> well, this behaves pretty much as expected, because the blue rectangles are the physics body outlines. So this is not falling over. I'm going to correct that by turning on per pixel physics which is as simple as selecting the objects I want to use, changing their physics definition to use the alpha mask. Then I'm going to simulate again, and the right thing happens. OK, well, that was easy. Let's move on to showing you the new feature of field forces. So field forces are super easy to use inside Xcode. And I implore you to try them out, play with them here. And it's one of the best places to do that. I'm going to drag a theoretical field in here called a spring field, which acts as if there was a spring connected between the field and any of the nodes that I'm going to enable it on. So I'm going to pick some of these balls here. I'm going to enable the spring field on them by setting their physics field mask to something other than zero. I've done that. Now I'm going to simulate this. You notice they all drag towards the center of the spring there. And you notice also as they collided, they collided with the uh, inert balls, so not enabled on the field mask. So they actually full physics running, and the field only affecting the balls I selected. Super easy and fun to use. Next up, I want to take you through how to put 3D content inside your sprite scene. So just bear with me while I go through the steps here. <sighs> All right. I'm going to drag that ship in, and done. All right. So that was step one, two, and that's it. You can see it's 3D. I'm going to try that again in case you missed it. So here we go. An alien. OK. So step one, that's everything you need. So this is just a quick preview of some of the great new features we've added to Sprite Kit and Scene Kit in Xcode 6. Thank you so much. Back to Jeff. Thank you, Jacques. So that was some of our high level high-performance, super-efficient 2D and 3D games API. Now let's go from the high level right down to the GPU. We've been optimizing the heck out of the graphics stack with our new low-overhead API, Metal. So why is that? What, what does that give you? Well, many games want to run at 60 frames per second. So a little bit of math shows you that you have a bit over 16 milliseconds for every frame. We put that on a timeline. What we can see is that you have to get your, all your application work done, you have to issue your drawing calls, and the system framework has to turn those drawing calls into GPU commands all within that 16 milliseconds, or you'll start to drop frames. 
And of course, that's just one of a number of frames you have to, you have to produce to make a truly interactive experience. So let's expand that first frame out. We see there's two distinct parts. The first part is the application piece. The second part is this, that system framework, that GPU API. Well, Metal is super efficient at reducing the second part to the bare minimum. So what this gives you is more time. More time for AI, more time for physics, more time for more drawing, more time to make your game even more brilliant. So Metal allows you to unlock the power of the GPU. It gives you easy access and full control over the rendering pipeline. It has features like the direct control over the creation and encoding of GPU command buffers. It also provides a unified shading language for both graphics and compute with offline compilation. As you saw this morning, Unity, Crytek, Epic Games, and Electronic Arts have all committed to supporting Metal. And today we have Johan Andersen from Electronic Arts here to show us what they've been able to do with their Frostbite engine on top of Metal. Johan. Welcome. Thanks, Jeff. It's really great to be here. Um, I'm one of those first-time Mac and iOS developers, so hello. Um, um, we've been building, for the last couple of weeks, a new renderer using Metal for our game engine Frostbite. All right. uh, using our goal with using this new low overhead graphics API oh, it. can we restart? <laughs> that started way too early. Yeah. Sorry guys. <laughs> Good. A bit too excited here. Oh. Our goal with using Metal, this new low overhead graphics API, is to try and enable the wide set of capabilities of our Frostbite engine on iOS. And to showcase this, we built a new demo in the world of Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare, one of our latest console games. Let's have a look. Oh. Yeah, we're loading a little bit. So here we have the zombies, our enemies. Advancing on the plants uh, for defending their garden center. This is the same Frostbite engine that we use to power our AAA console games, such as Battlefield 4 and Need for Speed. Here, running on iOS. One of the biggest changes we saw with using Metal instead of OpenGL was that our rendering submission times on the CPU became five times faster. This is really quite impressive, and it's a, it's a really good benefit because it frees up 80% of one of our CPU cores, which makes it a lot easier for us to build full games, games with even more animation, physics, and audio. Uh-oh, it doesn't look like it's going that well for the plants here. Let's see what they do. <laughs> Thanks everyone, we're really happy with the result we're getting. And let's take a closer look at some of the action we have here. So this is rendered in real time in Frostbite with Metal on an iPad Air. Uh, and it's interactive. Nicholas is here is, uh, moving around with the camera. And one of the key benefits that we're getting from Metal is that we get fine green control over the GPU and the overall system. We can build command buffers efficiently in parallel and we can control them. We can explicitly manage GPU resources, which significantly reduces overhead for us and makes it a lot easier to keep a significantly better and stable frame rates. Let me let's pause in this scene here. This is a really quite interesting scene with tons of stuff going on. And there's tons of VFX, debris, and this large animated characters interacting. And there's a lot of components coming together to be able to create these type of environments here. And here we have two very detailed and great looking characters, sunflower and cactus. 
we're running dynamic shadows for everything in this scene, and not just the characters, but everything really. And this is really quite heavy, but it makes the characters and everything fit in with regardless of the, where the lighting condition is in the environment. Did you? Oh. Well, let's look at it again. Yeah. We've been working on uh, on this for just a couple of weeks, uh, but we're really quite interested in all of the results we're getting. We're really happy about it. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here we have the big animated robot again. It's a zombie robot. I'm not sure how that works, but he seems to be very well animated. Uh, so we're rendering up to 1.2 million triangles per frame. Uh, that's really quite a lot, and we're really happy we can do that. And together with that, we're doing around 20 different rendering passes for our HDR rendering, for shadows, for image occlusion, for particles, and for distortion. And as you can see in the background, we have this nice little field effect going on that sort of frames the action a little bit more. And we're really happy that we can, well, I'm really excited and really impressed by the amount of geometry and effects that we can push through the GPU. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. And this enables us to use the same content, the same features that we're using for building console games, but here on iOS. It makes it significantly easier to, to, to work with this as a platform. So Metal, for us, is literally a game changer. It, it's a key enabler for a new set of full 3D games uh, on iOS. And we at Electronic Arts are super excited to support it and put this in the hands of our game teams and see what they can create. Thank you. Thanks to Johan Electronic Arts. That was simply stunning. It's amazing the power of the GPU that Meta allows you to unlock. So it has never been easier to take an amazing idea and to brilliant, build a brilliantly successful game. We can't wait to see what all of you are going to build. Thank you very much, and I'll hand it back over to Andreas to talk about extensions. All right. Extensions represent, represent another very important new technology direction that we are opening up for third-party developers on both iOS and OS X. They represent the ability to hook into various kind of system behaviors, and they allow users to expand and customize our core operating system functionality. Extensions are bundles that ship inside your apps. They get downloaded from the App Store with your apps, and they get removed from a system if the user uninstalls your apps. So that the user doesn't get flooded with unexpected new behaviors, they stay in full control of which extensions are active in their UI. They get to explicitly activate each extension they wish to use. Right. The users in system preferences and settings. In technical terms, extensions are short-lived, out-of-process services that get launched by our OSs on demand. If configured to do so, they can share data with the apps they are embedded in. For example, to access keychain items or any other kind of preferences. Extensions are, of course, sandboxed, and we even developed this cool new remote view technology that hosts an extensions user interface inside our system apps and dispatches user events back to the extensions process without the app being able to see it. So extensions are designed to be very secure. And since extensions typically share a lot of code with their apps, we now allow you to use bundled frameworks on iOS. So you're not limited anymore to static libraries. You can now bundle resources and binaries in fully supported frameworks. Now here's a list of the extension points that we are making available in this year's iOS and OS 10 releases. And more will follow in the future, but you think this is a great starting point. Let's go over these one after the other. There are many online services out there that allow users to post comments or share things like pictures and videos. And while we support the largest ones directly in our OSs, we realize we can't support them all. So if you are running one of these online services, sharing extensions are a great way to let users comments, links, and media to your service from within any app they might be running. Actions allow you to take user data, anything from text to images, audio, and more, and, trans and transform that data into a new representation. For example, you could write an extension that takes source code and X code and reformats it to your wishes, perhaps with a three-space indentation. And photo editing extensions are actions that manipulate images. 
but we make sure that we keep the original around so that edits are non-destructive. Safari actions are meant to protect web pages. Now they have a lot of flexibility because they get access to the full DOM on the way in and out. So they can completely re-render an entire web page while the user is browsing, for example, through a language translation. Notification center widgets allow you to place quick at a glance views inside the iOS and OS 10 notification centers. You can use them for displaying pretty much any kind of status information or for offering helpful utilities to the user. They're mostly designed to display short, concise data, but they also allow for simple user interactions. And among other things, they are great launch points to jump out into the full app. Document providers extend the newly designed iCloud document picker and allow you to access additional storage mechanisms. For example, in an enterprise that uses a third-party cloud. And we offer a similar mechanism on OS 10, where remote file sync services can annotate Finder with their sync status. Another very important new mechanism is the ability to provide third-party keyboards. You can use that to support additional languages, or any kind of input methods that you might think about. Creating extensions is as simple as creating apps. The extended Xcode with all the things you might need, such as new templates, additional scheme settings so that you can launch the apps that actually host your extensions. We improved our XPC service debugging capabilities, and we even added additional simulators for some of the extension points. So extensions are a very powerful new mechanism to customize our operating systems, and we think they're going to be very, very popular with our users. Next, we're going to talk about new APIs in iOS 8. And for that, I'm going to hand over to Toby. Thanks, Andreas. Good morning. Well, as you heard this morning, we've got a pretty big release for you this year. In fact, this is almost as large as the original iPhone SDK. Now we took a focus, we took a very focused approach to this release. The major theme this year is integration. Integration with the OS. Andreas just told you how your apps can plug into the system and even other applications. We're integrating across our devices with our new cloud and continuity features, and we're providing deeper integration with the hardware and even with the world around. Let's start by taking a look at two of our more popular applications. Underlying each of these is a very rich set of API. We've introduced a new photos framework this year and have greatly enhanced the media API with many long-standing requests. Combined, they form the foundation of a photographic platform that brings your applications in right alongside our own. The new Photos Framework gives you direct access to the user's photo library with no need to import a copy of anything anymore. And you can even make changes directly with the appropriate permission. And with iCloud Photo Library, you can access the user's entire collection of photos and movies without having to worry about whether they're local or stored in the cloud. We take care of that for you. The new camera API gives you full manual control over the camera settings, which I think is something that many of you have wanted for a while. You can set the, the lens position explicitly, the white balance or color temperature, and various exposure settings like the shutter speed and ISO. And these are all the same APIs that our applications are using. A great new feature lets you grab a burst of photographs, each with different exposure settings. And with the video toolbox, you can now access the hardware H.264 encoder and decoder directly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, we announced a number of great new initiatives this morning, and we're going to cover them all in great detail this week. I want to touch on just a few of them now. First, local authentication. This lets you ask the user to authenticate using Touch ID, ID right in your application. It's a very simple API, and we tell you whether the authentication succeeded or not. At no time, though, do you get access to the user's biometric information. That's stored away securely so that not even our own applications can get access to that. Handoff lets you start a task on one device 
and pick it up seamlessly on another Mac, phone, or, or iPad. Create an NS user activity to encapsulate a, a, an activity in your app, such as opening a web page. And then as the context changes, you update that activity. And note that this contains only the metadata for the activity, such as the document URL or scroll position. You need to find an alternate means for getting the actual data across to the other devices. Now, once you've created this activity, we'll take care of advertising it across, it across all of your devices. We're going to tell only the devices which are actually near you, so you don't need to worry about your computer at home revealing when you're surfing the web at work. Health and wellness has become extremely popular lately, with new applications and devices exploding on the scene every day. HealthKit provides a platform where your applications can store and share health-related information. We can import kinds of data automatically from standard supporting devices such as your blood pressure and glucose levels, and your app can read and write over 60 different kinds of information, ranging from fitness to nutrition to medical information. Now, all of this is extremely sensitive, of course, and so we give the user extremely fine-grained control over who can access what. Now, I'd like to talk about design a little bit. Last year, of course, well, we completely revamped the iOS UI. And I told you at the time that we were only just beginning. Now, that wasn't a threat. We continue to add refinements, but just not at quite the same breakneck pace as we have before. Interactive notifications let you provide the user with custom actions right there in the notification banner. And as you heard this morning, they even work on the lock screen. Now, because your users want to focus on their content and not the Chrome around it, in landscape, we're automatically hiding the status bar and shrinking or hiding the navigation bar and toolbars. And we have a new compact style for action sheets in landscape. We're continuing to push support for dynamic type throughout our own applications, and we've greatly enhanced the API in UIKit and WebKit to make it even easier for you to adopt. And finally, we have a new settings pane, which combines applications preferences with all of the various system privacy preferences, such as whether the user wants to receive notifications from your app. We've put them together in one place here now and given you a simple API so that you can take the user right here from within your application. Now, I read this quote on John August's blog, August's blog a couple of months ago. Adding landscape to the iPhone isn't impossible, but it means not doing something else. And right now, the many something else's are worth a lot more. That really resonated with me, because we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how to manage the proliferation of UI layouts. When we launched iPhone seven years ago, it was pretty simple. You had one screen size and two user interface orientations to deal with. A few years later, we added iPad, and now you had to use a global user interface idiom to select between your iPhone and your iPad layouts. Then we added iPhone 5 with its larger screen size, and now you've got a total of six screen bounds to have to contend with, and that's getting to be rather a lot. And so we've been working to try and rationalize things for you. Now, in iOS 8, you can use a single storyboard across iPhone 4, iPhone 5, Portrait and Landscape, and here's where things get interesting, on the iPad 2. Now, hang on a second. We've always encouraged you to design explicitly for iPad's larger screen size and not just blow up your iPhone UI. And we're not backpedaling on this message now. Different screen sizes demand a different user experience. And so we've been teaching storyboards and our view controllers how to adapt themselves to the environment that they're in. In this example here, it's actually the same split view controller class running on both the iPhone and the iPad. On the phone, well, it looks and behaves like a single column navigation browser. And on the iPad, 
you get the split pane master detail view that you're probably pretty familiar with. We're introducing a new notion called size classes to try and express this idea of how big something is. Broadly speaking, you can think of the iPhone size UI as a compact size class and the iPad UI as a regular size class. But don't make the mistake of thinking that size classes are bound to a particular device. They're a lot more general than that. For example, in this split view controller on iPad, it has two child view controllers. The one on the left here, well, it kind of looks like an iPhone UI, and in fact, it has a compact size class, whereas the one on the right has a regular size class. This idea of things adapting themselves to the space that they're contained in forms the basis for something that we're calling adaptive UI. And this is what makes it possible for you to use a single storyboard on iPhone 4, iPhone 5, and the iPad. Now, I'd like to ask Max Strachan to come up and give you a quick tour of how easy this is to do in Xcode. Max? I missed you guys, especially you, Craig. All right, I'm going to show you how uh, size classes in iOS 8, if I can get the right screen up, uh, allow me to create a single storyboard that is adaptive for both iPhone and iPad. Uh, okay. Interesting. That's a new one. Let's switch to the backup. It was bound to happen. Somebody had to pay the price. Nice. Technical assistance. Ah, uh, it's the old turn on mirroring trick. Mr. Christian Wagner. All right, now let's talk about storyboards and adaptive UI in iOS 8. Here's my Party Finder app, no sleep at DubDub. It's a pretty simple little thing. There's a login screen on the left and a, a list of parties on the right. Now, the astute among you may notice that my layout is square. Why is that? Well. Because size classes are, uh, they're, uh, wow. Since size classes aren't, they're not real, one size class doesn't necessarily map to one device and one orientation. The uh, layout canvas in, uh, in Interface Builder is also that way. Wow, could have done that better. Now, just because I'm, so I'm laying out my interface this way, I, I still want to see how it looks on real devices when it gets in people's hands. For that, I have the preview assistant. In Xcode 6, the preview assistant allows me to add multiple devices and orientation so I can see how my interface is working in as many uh, devices and, and layouts as I want. And here you can see that I've already specialized for one of the size classes so that my interface looks different on an uh, iPhone in landscape orientation. Now if I select my other view controller, we can see my party table. And this I haven't specialized at all. That's because table views, like many views, are themselves adaptive. And so there's no specialization that's necessary at all. Let's go back to my login screen. Now, Interface Builder starts you out in the size class for any width and any height. 
So this is where you lay out what is common about your app across all size classes. It's a great place to do edits that you want reflected everywhere. For instance, if I want to move this shiny little graphic up into the corner, that will get reflected in both landscape and portrait. But because one size class does not fit all, I can also tell Interface Builder to edit in different size classes. In this case, I'm going to choose Compact Height, which is the size class that maps to an iPhone in landscape orientation. And now, when I make an edit, for instance, moving all these objects up, that will only be reflected in the landscape orientation. Now if I add an iPad to the mix, we can see yet another take at positioning and sizing these same elements. And once again, these are all the same elements with the same logic, style, connection still attached. They're just positioned and sized differently because they have different constraints. So if I were to change the nature of something, like the background image here, that will get reflected in all of the size classes. That's a quick take at size classes in iOS 8 and one storyboard to rule them all. Back to you, Toby. And so that's just a taste of some of the things that we have for you in iOS 8. We can't wait for you to get your hands on it and start playing with it. Now I'd like to talk about iCloud. iCloud is an important and thriving part of the Apple ecosystem. We have well over 400 million users, and we're continuing to improve and add new features to it all the time. First, let's talk about iCloud Drive. So we introduced documents in the cloud a few years ago, of course. And it provides a seamless in-app experience to getting your files from device to device to Mac. And that's great if you happen to have the same application running on your phone, your iPad, and your Mac. But that's not always the case. iCloud Drive gives you a folder right there in Finder where you can manage your files directly. And we're even making this available on Windows, too, in the Explorer. Now, if you're already a document-based app, it's actually pretty easy for you to add support for iCloud Drive. On the Mac, you get it basically for free with AppKit. On iOS, however, you can't access the files in iCloud Drive directly without some form of user intervention. Well, that's done in this new UI Document Picker class, which lets the user select the files that they want to use in your application. We then dynamically extend your application sandbox around those files so that you can read and write them directly without having to make a copy of anything anymore. And this even works across different application containers so that multiple cooperating applications can all work together on the same file. We told you earlier how document providers let you extend your device with alternate file storage systems. And these are all managed by the UI document picker. And so once you're adopting that, there's nothing else for you to have to do in your application to take advantage of these document providers. And that's iCloud Drive. We think it's pretty easy. Now, I'm really excited to be able to tell you a bit about CloudKit. Simply put, CloudKit lets you write client server applications without having to write the server part. Let's say you've got a hot idea for a coffee shop review service or, I don't know, a photo sharing service. Well, here's what you don't have to do with CloudKit. You don't have to write any server code. You don't have to operate a 24 by 7 service. And you don't have to deploy any servers. And in fact, once you become wildly successful, Here's something else that you don't have to do. All, <laughs> All you need to do to build a client server application with CloudKit is write your iOS and Mac app, and we take care of all of the rest of it for you. 
So when we were designing CloudKit, we asked ourselves the question, what do you need in the cloud to be able to do all of this? Well, a database seems like a good place to start. We've got records and relationships, queries, all the things you come to expect from a NoSQL database. We have an asset API to efficiently store and retrieve large blobs of data. And we have a subscription service. You can think of the subscri subscription service as kind of like a long-running query on the server. And as new records are matched by the query, iCloud will send out push notifications to all of the devices that have registered an interest in that subscription. We built a developer portal that you can go and take a look exactly at what's going on with your service in the cloud. And of course, you're going to want users. Well, it turns out we've got rather a lot of them in iCloud. And every single one of those iCloud users can be your user as well. There's no account to create, no sign up, or any hoops they have to jump through. And we think that's pretty huge for you. As Craig told you this morning, it's basically free up to these maximum limits. Now, that's one petabyte of asset data. To put this in perspective, let's say that you're building a photo sharing service and you're using the same image size as some of your popular competitors. That would let you store 10 billion photos in iCloud for free. And we think that's pretty huge, too. We're doubling down on this technology ourselves. iCloud Photo Library and iCloud Drive are both built on top of CloudKit. We see this as the foundation for our services moving forward. We think this is really cool, and we've been working on it for a while and can't wait to see what you do with this. We think this is going to open up a whole new class of application for you. And that's what we have for iCloud. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Andreas to tell you about OS X Yosemite. Thank you. All right, let's talk about OS X. Yosemite is a big new release with an all new look. We carefully evolved this look from our previous releases to make it truly beautiful without being disruptive. The basic ideas behind the redesign were to increase consistency, to reduce visual noise and clutter, to make animations more subtle, and increase the vibrancy of the UI for more liveliness. Let's go over the cornerstones of the new look and what they mean to app developers. We started by completely redesigning our window Chrome. We made our toolbars and our title bars simpler and more compact. But for non-document-based apps, we went a whole lot further and defined a new style of window Chrome. Many of our apps now use a combined toolbar in which we merge the title bar and the toolbar into a single compact row. This is a great way to give users more space for their content. But it only works well if you have few enough toolbar items to leave enough space so that the user can grab the window and drag it around on the screen. So this is not recommended for all apps. Now, for several of our apps, we also moved the search fields, which have historically been located at the far right side of our toolbar. Smack into the middle of the window, if searching is the primary way of interacting with that app, such as is the case in Maps and Safari. 